Welcome to Ink and Magic, a podcast where we read and discuss the writing craft, world building, and romance of paranormal and fantasy novels. If you love books with bite, set in worlds of magic and mayhem, then you're in the right place. My name's Nikisha Shanae. I go by an S. And I'm Leslie. I write as L. Penelope. And welcome to the show. Hey, Leslie. Hey, Inez. We are back. We are back with a solo craft episode. We've been talking to our friends for weeks, and we talked to some more friends, too, coming up. But today, it's just the two of us because of this conversation. (laughs) This started because Inez, of course, is the queen of analyzing things, specifically romance. And she came up with this theory that we had to test and has gone through some changes, but now we're going to present the theory to you all. So the theory, um, I heard the theory started with Michael Haig because I love romantic comedies. I love romantic comedy movies. I love romantic comedy books. I love sitcoms that are all, that are romance and funny. So um, at some point I was watching Michael Haig. He had a, he had a class on romantic comedy. So of course I bought it. Yeah, he's a um he teaches screenwriting and storytelling and he's got really great information about character arcs. He he used to back in the day. I've I've seen him at conferences and I'm sure you could buy his classes online. So he's just a a a, te- a writing teacher essentially. Mhm. Mostly screenwriting. Okay. I remember my was it my very first RWA? I've only been to two. So I think it was the very first RWA that we went to in New York City. mm mm-hmm. Mhm. And he was there because I remember it was standing room only. And I made yeah. my, we're, we're, you, you and I. I was it. sitting on the floor Me for too. the presentation. So, right. We made our way. I think we were wearing skirts too. We made our way to the front and we just copped a squat on the floor. Yeah. <laughs> I remember this. And I write pages of notes, pages and pages of pages. notes. Pages. Because, yeah. And, and it changed the way that I do characters, honestly. Like, I still, to this day, one of my many tabs in my spreadsheet, I'm a spreadsheet plotter. Is Michael Higgs and his, you know, his rules for character development, essentially. Yes. So in addition to these rules that he has for character development, he did this class on romantic comedies. And and I I think I'm funny. <laughs> I don't funny. I didn't know I didn't know how to how to plot funny. And I thought to write a romantic comedy, you have to be cracking jokes every couple of pages. So I buy this class thinking that that's what he's gonna be talking about. Every five pages, you need to make a joke. That's not what he was saying at all. Thank goodness. I know, right? So he was talking about how romantic comedies are funny because of the deceptions. And I was like, wait, what? What do you mean the deceptions? And Michael Haig basically shows you how that when you, when we're in the first act of a romantic comedy, one or both of the love interests are trying to deceive either the other person or other, or other people in their world. And I thought, huh, that's interesting. And not only are they trying, are they going along, going around deceiving people, but at some point that deception has to be revealed. So you have these two pieces, this yin and the yang. And for most of the film, starting in act one, going through act two, the, the hero or the heroine, whoever the deceiver is, is trying to hold on to this, the deception and hide the truth. And those situations that they get into, that's what makes a rom-com funny. I had never heard or thought of it like that, but it does make sense. And if you start breaking down these movies, and I'm sure it works in books too, but that is a large part of the comedy. Now, I, of course, I'm always trying to think of like ways to poke holes in it. But <laughs> yes, present us with the, 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 the kinds of deceptions because you discovered yeah. or identified. So I sat down. I have a, those who laughs at me, I have a, a viewing book because I love to journal. So I have like a TV and film viewing book. And I started to, I went, I think we have um, these stores here. I live in Virginia. We have these stores here in Virginia called Second and Charles where they sell like um uh it's like consignment and they sell like uh dvds and video games it's it's a heaven for a reader and consumer of media so i went to second and charles and i went to the rom-com section of the dvds because i still have not one but two dvd players and i just grabbed a handful of rom-coms because they were like two dollars a dvd i grabbed a handful and i was determined because michael Haig just talks about the deception and the revelation i was like no there's got to be more So I sat down and I started watching these rom-coms and I was looking for the patterns. 
And originally I came up with a lot of kinds of deceptions. Mm -hmm. So I saw, huh, there's an identity deception or someone is an imposter pretending to be someone or something that they're not. Mm -hmm. My favorite example, um, coming to America. Right. Yeah. Right. Prince Akeem comes over. He wants to have, he wants to sow his royal oats <laughs> and he winds up working at McDonald's. <laughs> yes. But he's pretending to be something that he's not in a, in a, a not a, uh, a completely updated, but a more updated one was the Prince and Me with Julia Stiles. And I can't remember his name. Oh, yeah. I don't know what his name is, but that was another one too, where he goes to co- a prince goes to college, mm-hmm. pretending to be a commoner, pretending to be a commoner. Um, and then there was the bet deception. We see this so much in teeny bopper films. So films like 10 things I hate about you. And you can go even further back um, and find other ones where people will make a, a bet to win the, win somebody who was either out of their class above or below it. Um, so they, they make this this bet and they're mm-hmm. trying to win the bet. And that's the deception. There was, I saw that people were, a lot of times they were trying to hide their true feelings, like they're in love, but they're, they can't let that be known. Like, for example, this is not a rom-com, but you, everybody will know what I say when I mean my best friend's wedding. Mm-hmm. That should have been a rom-com. It should have ended happily. <laughs> it should have, excuse me. It should have ended happily ever after in the romance, but. I digress. But she was trying to hide her true feelings. Right. Um, sometimes there's another love interest that um, like a, a triangle kind of mm-hmm. thing. Um, there's sometimes when when I saw where they were trying to sabotage the, um, the relationship and also there was fake relationships and I just kept whittling it down. So I presented this list <laughs> to Leslie and another friend <laughs> trying to say, okay, this is what I found. And I, and I came with, because we have, we have a weekly mastermind. And in our weekly mastermind, we can talk about whatever we want to talk about. But a lot of times I'm coming in, I'm presenting my theories. And I presented this with examples. And Leslie was like, yeah, that one, that makes, that one makes sense, but that one doesn't. So long story long, yeah. <laughs> I whittled this, that initial list down to four. To number one, the identity deception the bet deception. I'd started calling one relationship status, but I realized that was still all about the identity and the true feeling that was all still pretty much about the identity. And the fourth one is the magic potion. So we're going to talk about these. I think we missed the first one, the Mary War. Identity bet. Oh yeah. Sorry. The Mary War, which is the, the, the my favorite one. And that title is thanks to Leslie because she point Leslie is the researcher. Even you know, I like to sit down and break things down. Leslie will then find research. Even though she pokes holes in my stuff, she'll find research to help me back things up. Absolutely. Because I'm not going to come up with a theory, but I will come up with things that either support or go against your theory. So I mean, I'm helpful like that. So she um, sent me this um, article about how most rom-coms are based on Shakespeare plays. Yeah. And the first one, yeah, it was really great. And so I had spent a lot of time trying to figure out, is, is, can each of these be a Shakespeare play? And I <laughs> didn't 100% get it. But um, the first one that they were talking about, where it was all about um, kind of like opposites attract, they called it a merry war. And I was sold. Yeah. Be- and that comes directly from one of the plays, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the quote. I- think Midsummer Night's Dream maybe? That sounds right. Yes. And that's the one I've seen most recently, oddly enough, which is a, incredibly a merry war. Like when you watch a good production of Midsummer Night's Dream, you're like, oh, that that actually fits so well. So in the merry war, um, you have the, the deception is all about the tension between what the lovers, usually hero and a heroine, what they say and what they truly feel. And the they're trying to keep their feelings hidden, sometimes from themselves, right. but always from each other. And the, the revelation, that dark moment, comes when they have revealed their feelings to one another. And the war is kind of, the war is, is, is won, maybe. <laughs> Well, I, yeah, we'll have to talk more about that because sometimes Mm -hmm. it seems like the revelation is not, well, the dark moment 
is can still be a breakup without a revelation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. So I think, yeah, I think that those are, those are two plot points Mm -hmm. and they can, they can overlap or they can be the same. I feel like the revelation is a, um, a lot of times spoken out loud because it's revealed to each other and probably to the rest of their community. But the dark moment is when they lose each other. So the deception mm-hmm. okay. revealed might not be them actually losing each other. It's just the the, the jig is up. And then there's a now, what are we going to do? Mary Wars basically includes your opposites attract, your enemies to lovers. Yeah. Um, a lot of those. And even, I think it also includes fake relationships mm-hmm. a lot of times. Um, yeah, marriage of convenience, maybe. Mm-hmm. Yep. It's, a big, it's a big tent. It is. It's a very big tent. A lot of my initial patterns that I saw, I saw that they fell under the Mary War because it's any type of pulling mm-hmm. um, trope where they're repelled for some kind of a, for, for some kind of a reason. Mm-hmm. And um, my testing ground for this, and this is also how I won Leslie over, was one of <laughs> Leslie's films, Leap Year. <laughs> one of my favorite rom-coms ever. <laughs> that was grumpy sunshine to the max, man. See, it's kind of, but I don't know that I see Amy Adams' character in Leap Year as sunshine exactly. She's a little too type A to be sunshine. I feel like sunshines are generally warmer, friendlier, cuddlier. He is definitely a grump, Mm -hmm. but it's opposites attract. Mm -hmm. It is enemies to lovers, kind of, although I don't Mm -hmm. know why they're enemies, but they certainly get off on the wrong foot. Mm -hmm. And for most of it, it's like they don't admit to themselves until past the midpoint, maybe, that they're even into each other. Yep. And so, yeah, it's just a delightful interplay that um, magnetic uh, like attraction and pulling apart is done really well. Yes, and it bec- the movie is is super funny because you see all the clashes. It's mm-hmm. it's them against one another. Oh, she wants to pack her things up nicely. Well, he just throws on the clothes that he has in a bag. <laughs> she wants to plan and maybe use a map, which doesn't really happen. And he wants to just take it as as it as it goes. So it's she wants to control everything very tightly. Yes. And he understands it can't be controlled. Yes. Life is chaos. <laughs> Life, yeah, life is absolutely chaos. So I would say she maybe isn't sunshine. She is like toxic positivity, but she's yeah. still positivity. Yeah, she's she's on the positivity spectrum. <laughs> <laughs> so they 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 keep having these challenges in this film, and, and in most Mary Wars, they keep having challenges get thrown at them, and you see the heroine try to solve it her way, and it backfires. You see the hero trying to solve it his way, and it backfires until what you see them start to compromise Mm -hmm. and it's the compromise when things that's when I think they start to to, if they aren't already in love they start to fall Mm. so yeah I think in in leap year I'm assuming y'all all have seen leap year and if you haven't please get yourself to your nearest streaming service wherever it's playing and watched leap year it's when they have this there's only one bed moment and I feel like that's where it really started to coalesce that she notices him as he comes out of the shower and they're forced to share this bed because they have to pretend to be married or else they won't have a place to stay because the caretakers are very Christian. And so, you know, they don't admit it. They really don't admit it until the very end. Yeah, the very end. But you see it on screen with their reactions to each other starting to change around that time. So the revelation in Leap Year, but also in a lot of Merry Wars is when they when they come to that acknowledgement, they admit it to themselves, they admit it to each other. Um, and then you have a dark moment. And in leap year, where you know we spoil things, in leap year, um, the leap year is all about um, Anna, the main, the, the heroine, she wants to propose to her boyfriend because it's been, a, it's been a minute and he hasn't proposed to her. And she hears this, um, this, uh, legend or something legend that on in in ireland on leap day february 29th you can the the girl can propose to the guy and it doesn't say whether he says yes or not but you know the girl can propose to the guy so she gets it in her head because her boyfriend is is, um going to dublin for business she gets it into her head well let me go there and let me propose to him and all kinds of acts of nature acts of god villains obstacles planes, trains, and automobiles get in her way <laughs> to doing this. And then 
once she finally reaches her boyfriend just in time and she does it, she's kind of like, huh, this dude who's been helping me the whole time get to my boyfriend Mm -hmm. is actually the right guy for me, even though we've clashed the entire way. But it was a fun clashing. It was a merry Merry war. war. (laughs) So the same thing happens. I want one more merry war. This because the other kinds of merry wars are the proposal. Again, marriage of convenience, right? Right. Um, but one of my favorite merry wars is um the hating game, both the book and the movie. Yeah, because the movie is very uh it cleaves to the book very closely. It does. It which is hard to do. It says to film. Well, Leslie was the film major. I was a TV major, <laughs> and it does. It adaptations are hard, but this is one of those adaptations that absolutely nails it and stands alone, right beside the book, which is absolutely amazing. So the Hating Game is all about um, car- the heroine's name is Lucy. The hero's name is Joshua, um, and their co um, assist their assistants to co CEOs of a publishing company. And loosely, loose. This is another grumpy sunshine. So Definitely Lucy grumpy sunshine. Is complete yeah. sunshine. Yeah. And Josh is grumpy, grumpy, grumpy. And and also the whole side of the publishing company, her side, because there was two companies that merged, is loose and artsy and sort of hippie-ish. And his side is corporate and buttoned up. And so on every level, opposites attract. And they have this enemies to lovers thing because they play the hating game, which is very ridiculous, but somehow it works for romance reasons that they kind of stare each other down there. They, they face each other in this office. It's all like put together so well. And so they're just staring at each other all day, like giving each other the evil eye. That's one of the games. Yes. The yeah. staring game. The, staring the opposite game. game. Right. Right. The but, copying game. So with them, it's both of them are hiding their attraction to each other from themselves and from one another until you know, the, I guess the dark moment. Well, that before the dark moment, they get together, but. So what's interesting here. So um, Michael Haig also has this whole inner journey that he takes characters on. And I think that Lucy and Josh's inner journeys are really important. Lu- one of the parts that, uh, cause we won't highlight the whole inner journey. We're thinking of maybe doing that as another episode. But one of the important things about an inner journey is that um, characters have a wound. Some people call it a ghost. And I think or not, that, I think. Oh yeah, yeah, you're right, a knot. Oh, I like that one. Um, but Lucy's wound is that she um has had uh some past experiences that have taught her to to value peace over authenticity. You also see in the film that um when Joshua came, um all of her friends got laid off. And oh, when he came to work there, mm-hmm. when when um the mer- the two companies merged. Yeah. So he based his company and him yeah, basically I think got rid of all of all of her friends. So she feels very friendless. Yeah, her work friends. Yeah. And, and she's so- new, she's still kind of new in town. Like she moved here. Right. She's from a strawberry farm and mm-hmm. now lives in the big city and is just, you know, too sweet for this world, I guess. <laughs> so her identity, this is another part of the inner journey, is she tries to make everybody like her. Right, right. And that goes so as far as to um, to be like a doormat. You mm-hmm. know, there are certain employees at the company that really take advantage of her good nature. And Josh tries to tell her you're too nice and tries to help her. But she's like, no, this is she thinks it's who she is. It's her false identity as being the nice one, the one that everyone walks over who will do anything for anybody. Yeah. Whereas with Josh, um, we don't learn what his wound is until over the midway point of yeah. the film when but it's constant it's hinted at where we learn that he has to go to the wedding of his brother yay but the bride is yeah his his brother is marrying his ex-girlfriend who had been together for a year and also the wound i think really is his parents everyone yeah. in his family but him is a doctor and he basically went to medical school for a little bit, but just failed out of it. It wasn't for him. And now he's in publishing. And his family, specifically his father, does not respect his choice of profession because everybody's a doctor. And I think that's really the wound. And, and he thinks maybe the girlfriend left him. Mm-hmm. As that, you know, we find out they weren't the right fit also. Yeah. But it stems from, and I don't know if that causes him to have self-esteem issues or it's just the pain of not being accepted for who he is and for what he really wants and values. 
But I really feel like their wounds really play with Josh and Lucy. I feel like their wounds really play into the deception of it, you will hurt me. If I get you too close and you see how I truly feel, you're going to hurt me. Mm. Yeah. So they so they're doing they're going through their 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 fun and games which you know we love to call the dates um and i think that when you have a merry war specifically that there's at least four dates i feel like there is a you let the audience see what the, their personalities are like and see them clashing that's almost like gives you the ordinary world of it all and then i think the second date is either a try it her way or try it his way, whichever you do first. But let's say we try it his way. And so you see what would happen if things were done the way that he wants. And you see in in, in the film, um, Josh or Lucy and Josh had vied to organize like a company team building exercise and Josh went out. And so Lucy has to go on this paintball company uh, game and she gets hurt. She gets, but she also gets sick. Like she's she's shot with paintballs, and and it's a really sweet scene because he's trying to protect her. But ultimately, she falls ill. It becomes extremely ill, and it's not really because of the paintball. She probably, would, I mean, it's a virus. She would have gotten. Ill anyway, but, <laughs> but it's like hit, doing it his way and doing it her way. Yeah. If they stay wounded, if they stay in their false identity, this is how things would go. Which is why it doesn't go right. Right. Because they haven't changed yet. Right. And so then I think there's a try it her way. So whichever, again, whichever you do first, but I think that you want to see both of these. So when we try it her way, um, I think that the try it her way is when Lucy tries to date someone else mm -hmm. and it doesn't work. Right. Because she winds up in the copy room kissing Josh. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't work out the way she thought it was going to work out. So you have their personalities clashing. So we see that you try it his way, you try it her way. And then I think that finally you need to try it their way. And that's kind of a compromise where they see how the relationship could work if they work together. And I think that this date is at the brother's wedding when they have each other's back. Mm. And I wonder how does this overlay on say Romancing the Beat, which is a book by Gwen Hayes and it's kind of a, a blueprint for romance novels. I'm sure that there's parallels. There. I think this is all in the falling in love fates. You know, I don't like, so, so Gwen Hayes has, I can't remember. She has, she has four um, act plotting, right? The first one is basically the ordinary world where they're getting to know each other and then they get a tease, meaning there's a reason that they have to stick together. In this instance with Lucy and Josh, they, um, they work in the same office and they're vying for the same position. That's the, the glue that's going to hold them together for the, for the whole duration of the book. Then, um, they get it. He's in, in the first act. In the second act, it's the falling in love. I think that all these dates would hit in the falling in love. Caveat, I don't like Gwen Hayes' act three. I mm -hmm. love Gwen Hayes. I think she's awesome and amazing. And she said some very nice things to me over email. But <laughs> Gwen, I'm sorry. I don't like act three because act three is all about like the clashing. I think it's important but I only like to do one or two things. I think she has like four plot points in there. And I'm like, five. I don't want to do five. Oh, I don't want to do all of these. Um, but I think this is run through a lot. Like I think in leap year, this is um, once, um, once they reach Dublin mm -hmm. and um, she, and um, oh gosh, I've forgotten her name. Heroin. Yes. Amy has, <laughs> has her, um, is preparing to propose to her boyfriend. Um, and then the hero walks out. I think that whole segment until we get to the grand gesture, I think that is all Gwen Hayes' act three. I think after the um the wedding in leap uh, in um hating game, I think that is before we get to the grand gesture, I think that is all Gwen's act three. And then I think from act four on, we have like the grand gesture. That is very interesting. That is probably more than we can deal with right now. <laughs> but no, because I have to think about it some more because I don't know. But I mean, in terms of talking about hating game, that wedding happens late in the book mm -hmm. slash movie. So we can't still be in phase two. You mm -hmm. know, it's got to be the second half of act two or Gwen's phase three, like just structurally. But that's a little less. Yeah, that's something that we have to think about. I don't know. I think if we put a timer to it, she moved things around like everybody doesn't follow our rules of course not nor should they <laughs> <laughs> but yeah i think she delayed it a lot because i felt like the end went shoop. i felt like the end of both of those 
books yes. really fast. That's true. Which is how I like it. Like, fine, have them apart for a minute and then rush headlong. And get them right <laughs> back together again. We don't want more than 10 minutes no. of screen time. No. I don't want more than a chapter. No. <laughs> no. But that's the Merry War. I know there's a lot going on there. Um, <laughs> that's just the first one. But that's my favorite one. And that's a big one because it's so many one. things are under that umbrella. It is. So the next one, um, the next kind of deception, I think, is the identity deception. And I feel that this is when the characters hide their true selves or they're hiding the relationship. For example, like if you're a celebrity, like mm-hmm. in um, Notting Hill, one of my favorites, <laughs> or my other favorite, um, if you're a royalty, like in Coming to America. So they're hiding their identities oftentimes so that they can experience like a normal life or there's some kind of a fake relationships where they're going to get a mutual benefit for it but you're hiding your identity or the relationship Mm -hmm. some my the two examples that i really enjoyed were um pretty woman where julia roberts plays a sex worker and notting hill where julia roberts (laughs) plays um uh, a celebrity who is um just chilling out in in the middle of a small little nook of London. So Pretty Woman is interesting for identity deception because Mm -hmm. if your theory is that the revelation, you know, the deception is, it's not between the two of them because they know who each other Mm -hmm. are. She's trying to deceive the larger world, Mm -hmm. right? You know, presenting herself as in a class that she doesn't belong to. Mm -hmm. But for the, um, the dark moment, it's not really a revelation, is it? Because the identity doesn't necessarily get revealed to his coworkers, does it? It's been like a couple of years since I've seen. No. Her. So the the deception in Pretty Woman is her trying to hide. It's only one sided, really. Mm-hmm. Because I mean, what's it going to do for him? Really, it's not going to be that big of a deal if people find out. But she, I feel like I felt like with her, she kind of got into being this woman. I f- we go back to Michael Haig who talks about our identity and our essence. We didn't talk about the essence in the in the last um, examples, but the identity is who you're pretending to be, mm-hmm. and your essence is your highest form of yourself. It's who you really want to be, and I think that Vivian wanted to be this respected, cultured, mm-hmm. adventurous woman. Um, And I think, I think a lot of times with the identity deception, this is the Pygmalion um, story or the Eliza Doolittle story (laughs) where someone is helping to make over that person in order to kind of elevate their identity. Right. Yeah. So the deception is her with herself. Yeah. Who am I really? Can I be this for real Mm -hmm. outside of this man who has kind of, you know, changed me or is providing this other life yeah i think it always goes on to whoever the pygmalion is like edward has um richard gear is the edward character he has his i think he has a minor character arc but i think vivian had a major character arc. she had a major transformation he didn't have to change too much he just had to change his mind right he didn't really have to change too much but vivian she changed everything she changed her occupation she changed how she wanted to move in the world she wanted to change her location she changed a lot about herself at by the end of this movie to to achieve her true essence once the deception was revealed and it was just revealed really to his business partner um, to edward's business partner because the some of her some of vivian's um Allies were the staff at the hotel. If you remember right. the concierge who was helping her. So that was a lot. And, and some people never believed the transformation. Like when she went on shopping the first time at Rodeo Jive, um, trying to pretend to be this higher form of herself and nobody bought it, which was devastating. But then when she goes out with Edward as her beard, almost, she gets accepted. As long as she's with him, she gets accepted. But when he... Um, when, when things are revealed and and he doesn't come for her and, and protect her the way that she wants him to protect her, that was like, that was the dark moment. So it was revealed um, to the friend, to Edward's business apartment. Edward's the one that reveals it. She's just a hooker. Mm-hmm. 
the that was the re- the revelation. The dark moment is when the friend, the business worker, the business coworker, her. yeah, propositions her, right? Because right. Edward told him who yeah. she really is. So that was the, for the relationship. That was the the low point. So it, yeah, I guess the, the yeah the revelation did spark that. And I'm thinking of my fair lady. The, the Pygmalion story is always hard. The My Fair Lady story, as much as I love the musical, it's a hard love story, the mm-hmm. way that they presented it. Because, um, yeah, because I think because the male character does not change that much. He has like mm-hmm. a sort of a revelation that he doesn't have far enough to go. No. So, yeah. No. Um, and with Notting Hill, I, 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 I just got excited that there were two Julia Roberts films. She's done everything. I mean, as many rom-coms as she did back in her day, or even this day, she's probably hit every one of these. Yes, I'm sure she has. There should be a, a college credit class on Julia Roberts films and rom-com deceptions. But yeah, with the Notting Hill, this is when she's hiding there. She's hiding her identity because everybody knows who she is. And she just wants a moment of just anonymity. She wants normal. And so they're hiding again the relationship, but this time she's a celebrity and she's falling for an average Joe. Okay. Um, and they have, I think, I again in trying to hide um, the relationship. There are there is the initial encounter when she comes into Williams into Williams Travel Bookstore. And for a second, he doesn't know who she is. And then he figures it out. And he's trying to play it cool. That was a fun deception. It's, it was it's a lot. Of course, this is this is a, a um, shot with a lot of British folks. So it's it's very, some of the humor is very subtle. Um, there's the orange juice spill where um, she, uh, William, who's again trying to play it cool, he spills orange juice all over her top. <laughs> and he has to help her like clean herself up. And he takes her back to his flat. There's a dinner, there's an other trying to hide the deceptions when they do decide to date and they go to his friend's dinner party and his friends are trying to play it cool. Like, oh, that's, oh yeah, that's her. Oh my God, that's her. Play it cool. And they're all trying to play it cool. So it's, it's, it becomes. It's not fun. really deception though. I mean, I guess it's, it's hiding. Mm-hmm. But like everybody knows and they're pretending not to know that is that the deception. They're keeping, I felt like they were all trying to keep the relationship because it was it wasn't that we were going to pretend that she's not famous. Mm-hmm. They're trying to protect the relationship. Mm-hmm. So when they come out of the friends and family circle and they're in with the press, they um um the first time that he's like, yes, where he where William is trying to, he's supposed to have a date with her. But he can't, he, she's not there waiting for him and he's trying to get access to her. You know how hard it is to get access to an actual celebrity? <laughs> and so, and that becomes funny because he can't get access to this woman who, he's, who he has a relationship with and he's trying to date her, but he can't tell that to anybody. But he's trying to make sure that she doesn't know that, she, that he is standing her up because he's trying to be here and get close to her. And so um, he pretends to be, he's a part of the press. So he's interviewing everybody in um, the cast until he gets to her. Which is again funny because he has to play this cover because mm-hmm. otherwise the relationship gets out. I have not seen Notting Hill uh, since it came out. I mean, I'm sure I saw it when it came out, but like I don't know this movie. It's delightful! I love this film. It's delightful. So the dark moment comes. I think well, the revelation comes when the press captures them together. Um, Julia Roberts, who feels completely comfortable and completely herself with this man. Um, Someone knocks on his door as she's hiding out and just in a love cocoon with him. And she goes to answer the door and it's the press taking pictures of her while she's dressed in nothing but his shirt. And she thinks that he set her up. Mm. Yeah. Sounds like a big misunderstanding to me. (laughs) Well, no, actually, I don't think so because she's been so jaded. Everyone, And she talks to him through the film about how everyone has hurt her. Her relationships are all in the public. I, uh, she just wants something private, something real. And she feels like she's finding that with him. Mm-hmm. So for me, that's when a revelation and a dark moment, they come one after the other. Click, click, click of the camera, relationship revealed. Thinking about, huh, how did this actually happen? And you hear her like putting two and two together. She, it comes up to, to three and not four. And she accuses him because that's what her experience has been. Mm-hmm. People have used her. And of course she got it wrong. And we get to the, the groveling and the happily ever after later. 
But I think that that is how the identity deception goes. I think so. Yeah. I mean, I'm thinking about how it works with other examples, but because you have to do it different ways. Yeah. Obviously, it has to come in different ways and you have to be, be able to twist and stretch it. So mm-hmm. it feels like a, a very stretchy type of deception. That's the thing, too. I think that people get really icked out and um, unhappy with me because I like my patterns and my formulas. But we're, at the end of the day, we're artists. Like, mm-hmm. if you, like, I, I can't even remember what colors I need to mix to get purple, <laughs> right? Right but I, when you when you write down that formula for me, I'm like, great. And then if I add a little white, I can get light purple. If I add a little something else, I can get a right. different shade. That's the artistry. But you have to mix, what was it again? Red and, red blue. and blue. Red and blue. But you have to mix red and blue together. And you see, I'm not going to remember that. So I have to write <laughs> it down. So you can write, if you, if you want to write purple, you can write light purple, you can write dark purple, you can write whatever kind of, you can write some swirls into your purple, but that basis has to be there in order for us to recognize that your painting is purple. Fair. Thank you. Onward. So we've got two more deceptions to go. Next up is the bet deception. This is what has launched a million teeny bopper films. But the bet deception is when one or both characters enter to enter into a bet or wager or some type of agreement that has an ulterior motive. So the stakes can be all kinds of things. The stakes can be money. The stakes can be a reputation. The stakes can be actual love. But they are they're they're they get into this bet for um in order to win the bet, not initially for romantic reasons. So it can be dating on a dare. It could be kind of a Pygmalion again, where but but this is Pygmalion is based on the bet. It, you like a makeover bet, and mm-hmm. I'm gonna make this person over, and I bet you that they can get a date or, or or what have you. That is what Pygmalion is. I'm starting to think that this whole bet is just a subset of identity, because hmm. you are pretending to be something that you're not in order to win the bet. I mean, yeah. the, the basis of My Fair Lady is the bet. I bet that I can present her for to the Queen of England or whatever the bet, the Colonel and um, Dr. Whatever his name was. <laughs> I want to say Dr. Doolittle, but that's not, that's not right. Why the Doolittle? Makes sense. So, yeah, I mean, it is its own thing. Mm-hmm. But it's kind of still under an identity deception because, well, maybe, maybe not. Because in... My fair lady, he's uh-huh. not pretending to be anything other than like she knows the bet is happening. Mm-hmm. Okay, I revise that. Okay. <laughs> you could also be pretending to be someone else. So it could be an identity. I do think these are layered. Mm-hmm. Um, you could be um competing to win over someone's affection. I've got some examples of those, or it can be about a task. So it doesn't have to be about the person example specifically. So I think one of uh, the ones that we think about a lot is Taming of the Shrew, mm-hmm. which a modern day adaptation of that is 10 Things I Hate About You. I'm sure everyone has seen that one and loved it with the wonderful Heath Ledger, um, the dearly departed Heath Ledger, when he um, had black hair. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, he played Patrick Verona and he was, he, he came back to school. He was, he was like there and gone a lot. And um, he's kind of like rebel without a cause, but he gets drawn into a bet that someone else makes and he's only there to collect money. And the bet is about the Stratford sisters. If Julia Stiles' character is Kat and Kat is just like, I hate the world. Her wound is that she had a really bad relationship that ended and she's just done with guys and the, the, the watercolored or rose colored glasses have just fallen from her eyes and she's like, screw the world. But her younger sister, Bianca, does want to date. She does want to play the high school social game. Um, and there's two guys that want to date. I feel like all the bets are in 10 Things I Hate About You. <laughs> and the two guys that want to date um, her, they're kind of playing off of each other too. Um, where one of them is a mastermind, he has real feelings for Bianca, but he masterminds to get another um, guy who has money to be the one to make a bet to to pay Patrick. <laughs> no, it's a little very complicated. Right, very complicated. It's all kinds of bets happening here. 
but um, they're trying to, the boys are trying to hide the bet. So that, and the goal is to get Bianca, the, sis, the younger sister. But while trying to hide this, Cat and Patrick start to fall in love. And Bianca, who wanted to date the, the more wealthy guy, whose name I think was Joey, um, she falls for the mastermind who really has feelings for her. So there's, there's, there's a lot of layers, a lot of layers going on in this particular bet. Uh, a much more simpler one is another 10 movie, which is How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days. Did you see that one, Leslie? When it came out, so I don't remember it. <laughs> I should have given the homework assignment to watch all of these. I don't have the DVDs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they're all streaming. But with ten, How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days, it's another bet. This could be like office romance and also bet where we have um, Andy Anderson, who's played by Kate Hudson. She's a journalist and she's doing these fluff pieces and she wants to do more substantial news. But she's given this assignment of, can you, how, can you make a guy break up with you in 10 days? And she's like, bet, I got this. At the same time that this is happening, Matthew McConaughey's character, Benjamin, he's an ad executive and he wants a diamond campaign. But, um, the women in his office are kind of challenging him and the women hear um, about Andy's assignment. Oh, they overhear, they're at a party. They overhear about Andy's assignment. And they're like, can you um, make any woman fall in love with you in 10 days? So these are competing bets with a clicking time clock and challenges accepted. Yeah. Layer it on. So their goals are in opposition. And we talk mm -hmm. about that in writing. If you can have, especially in a romance, the two main characters have their goals be opposite then that is juicy romantic conflict for you. And the really funny thing about the, 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 the deception in this romantic comedy, and remember the whole point, the funny, is trying to hold on to the deception. Mm -hmm. And I feel like in this one, in ten, How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days, Andy, the, the female heroine, she is trying so hard to break Ben and he's just just has to try to stand there and hold on because remember he bet that he could make her fall in love she bet that she could get rid of him so she's doing things where she buys him a fern and, and brings it to his house and he's kind of like um okay and then when she comes back later and of course he didn't take care of the fern and the fern is dying and she's like you're killing our love <laughs> and she is acting like she is crazy and he knows he has to win this bet so he stands there and he takes it and he tries to convince her no 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 i love you even though it's been like a day or two <laughs> um then there's the, another one that people might remember is when she makes a photoshopped family album of their amalgamated faces together, making it look like they had kids. <laughs> <laughs> I vaguely remember these things. And he is once again freaked out, but he can't let her go because letting her go means letting go of the campaign that he wants. And she can't seem to shake this guy. So it gets funny because both of their deceptions, even though they both have a bet deception, the substance of their bet deception is in complete opposition. So as both of them are trying to hold on, the audience is just cracking at their sides. It's really interesting because like, I've always been scared of comedy. I don't think I'm funny. I think that I can be funny when I'm not trying to be, or mm -hmm. not when I'm not trying, but like, uh, like not purposefully. Like I sit down to write a comedy. No, but if I write something and I'm thinking, oh, the characters are funny and light, it can come out funny. But this is an interesting sort of shortcut to comedy. If you understand that comedy is about deception mm -hmm. on some level, then you just set up the conflict exactly. and you just go through the characters' actions. What would they naturally do to meet these goals? And I think the funny happens. Exactly. That is that that is that is my whole point in obsessively studying this. <laughs> Because some of these books that I was reading, there weren't jokes on the pages, but I'm still laughing. Right, at the and situation. The situations. And it's and different than like slapstick. Like there's different kinds of comedy, obviously. I'm not a comedy. Yeah. There are some writers out there who are literally writing a joke every page and I'm bored mm -hmm. because they're just telling jokes and the situations aren't funny. Right. Like, there's no, there's no push pull in the situations. They're just on the page bantering. Yeah. And you have to be extremely skilled to do that. I think there's a handful of authors who do that well. Mm -hmm. But if that's what you're trying to do, that's super hard. Mm -hmm. This seems like an easier way 
to get laughs and to have the lightness be coming out of the actual situations and the clashes of the motivations and the I goals. Think I think it's a structured way because, you mm. know, writing is hard. <laughs> but you and I being consummate planners and plotters, we can sit down and say, what could be in opposition to this character's um, wound? What could be in opposition to this character achieving their essence? And we can make situations out of that. And because the situations, the way that we set it up, that's the funny. Mm -hmm. And we don't have to crack the jokes. Yeah. This reminds me, I just watched um, No Hard Feelings, which is the latest Jennifer Lawrence movie, which I did not want to see. It's where she is like a, you know, early 30s woman who is hired by the parents of a 19-year-old guy to date him because he's so shy and, and in his shell. That sounds cringeworthy. It did sound cringeworthy, but it's actually a really sweet, really nice movie. It is not as cringe as it sounds. They didn't do the things I was afraid they were going to do. Uh -huh. I actually liked it a lot. And I would actually mm -hmm. recommend it to my surprise because I had no intentions of watching this movie. But it's almost kind of a cross between an identity deception and um, a wager because she's hired. She needs the money to save her house. Her mom's mm -hmm. left her this house. But and he doesn't know that she's been hired. And so it's that's why I'm thinking identity deception can also very much overlap with this mm -hmm. sort of bet wager. Not exactly a bet, but she only gets the money that she needs if she goes through with this. And, you know, there is a revelation, obviously, that has to happen. Yeah. That tears things apart. And it's not because of the age difference. You know, I will. It's not like a cringe thing where this 32 year old is going to end up with a 19 year old. Mm -hmm. But it's still a rom com in a way because they care for each other, mm -hmm. you know, and there's a real core of, you know, to spoil non-romantic love that happens between these two characters, which is really touching. That's why it actually is, ends up being a good movie. I will, but we will all put that on our TBV pile. And while we put that on our TBV pile, we still have one more deception to get to. And it's my favorite. <laughs> it's the magic potion deception. Okay. Okay. Magic okay. podcast. <laughs> We are the Ink and Magic podcast, so of course. So what is the Magic Potion Deception? It involves uh, when a character possesses supernatural abilities or they're subject to magical interference that they have to conceal from each other. For example, the magic could be time, man time manipulation, where they turn back, turn forward, can repeat. 30, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Big. Yeah. Or, or, or they repeat specific moments like Groundhog's Day. Mm -hmm. It can be invisibility where you, for some reason you they can go invisible. You can't see them. What movie is that? I know that there is a movie where someone <laughs> there's there's ghost movies that are okay. that are this. Um, and then I think there is one where someone um, is in, invisible. I cannot remember the name of that. Sorry for not being prepared. There's body swapping, which is. Freaky Friday? Freaky Friday. Thank you, Freaky Friday. Um, there's mind reading, which um, what women want. And I think they oh, also did what men they want. They did. I didn't see that. But I, what women want is a classic. There's supernatural transformation um, where people can come um, something else. Put a pin in that. We're coming back to that. <laughs> um, then there's magical objects where something that you touch could be magic. But this is also the love potion. And one of my favorite films go growing up was this, was this Tara, oh, Tara, Tara um, Sandra Bullock film, Love Potion Number 9, which apparently nobody has heard about. But it was so cute. Um, and Tate Donovan. That's why I got that mixed up. The Mag love Potion Number 9 was a really cute film. Um, and then finally, there's Enchanted Realms, where um, they are either, either from someplace else or they are, have access to someplace else that they have to keep a secret and they're kind of navigating their dual lives. Um, I almost remember the name of the, the invisible person. <laughs> <laughs> it went out. So, um, 80s baby, so you have to understand that. But I'm sure we've all seen some version of The Little Mermaid. But for the perfect supernatural transformation, I present to you the film Splash. I think it makes sense because that's a rom-com and Little yeah. Mermaid's not really a rom-com. Yes. And you, there's funny moments in it, but it's it's for kids. This is the adult version <laughs> of The Little Mermaid. The movie is um it's the movie is about um a, a mermaid who names herself Madison because she's figures out that name when they're on Madison Avenue <laughs> in New 
York City. And um, cannot remember Tom Hanks's character, Alan. And Alan, and Alan had a um, a near drowning accident when he was a kid. But when you when you're watching the beginning of the movie and he's submerged underwater, you see he's just chilling and happy and smiling. So you, that and that comes back um at the end. But he can't remember what happened. But he know he has a fear of water now. Um, Madison was in the water with him as a mermaid when this happened and she never forgot him um, and as he gets older he has another water mishap and she saves him again but he's completely passed out this time but she decides I'm done I want to beat this guy I'm really interested in this guy so she decides to walk out of the water after she saves him she walks out of the water and fish don't have any qualms about clothing <laughs> so Madison, I remember this part a little bit yeah <laughs> She, Daryl Hannah, walks out of the water completely bug naked with only her long blonde tresses to cover her, <laughs> which starts the fun and games of this book as she tries to hide not only who she is, but what she really is. First, she's hiding it from Alan. And I feel like the revelation in this film comes when um, Alan finds out what she is because he's had that relationships he's he's no longer that carefree kid and over the course of their fun and games she gets him to loosen up they start to have a good time he stops caring because she's super weird because she's a mermaid (laughs) (laughs) super weird he's super weird and he gets over that um real quickly because he's fall he's there's just something about her he's falling for this woman and um then there's a, a crazy scientist because of course there is a crazy scientist who knows that she is what she is and he's trying to prove it and if madison's legs get wet she resorts to her mermaid state so of course you know that that was that was a ticking um that was a gun laid on the floor Check out gun. <laughs> the water is the gun <laughs> that gets laid um that gets caught and the crazed guy tosses the water at her and we see her on the streets of New York. She returns to her fish form. Um, that's a revelation. And the dark moment is they think that um, the government, because of course the government comes in, the government thinks that um, Alan is a fish too. And he, when he realizes that he's fallen for a mermaid, he shuts down. From and, her. Yeah, from her. He won't talk to her anymore. Um, and that becomes the dark moment of the film. She's given up everything for him. And now he won't even talk to her. Is it funny though? I guess her her fi- little fish out of water is the source of the humor too. <laughs> Leslie, I did not put that together. I'm so <laughs> mad. I did not put that together. Because it's kind of just, I'm, I'm just thinking, I haven't seen it in, in a million years, but is the source of the humor that she's hiding from him and from everyone else? Or it sounds like the source of the humor might be more so the fish out of water of it all, which is part of the hiding but it's still a different kind of comedy, I think. I think that's layered. I think the fish out of water are the biggest part of the situations that she keeps finding herself in, where she puts tons of salt on her food. And we're, as the audience, are laughing because we are in on the joke. Yeah. Um, she has to um, let her tail out at some point. So in she gets into the bath. Remember, remember that one? <laughs> so, um, and, and he takes her shopping, and that's funny too. So there's the fish out of water are the fun and games of this film and then once we get to the revelation and the dark moment it stops being funny yeah it's interesting how other tropes come in and you layer it on top of you know the this is not really trope i guess i don't know what you would call these things these deception categories but you layer in other tropes Mm -hmm. to uh intensify the humor and all, all the aspects, I guess. I think they could be tropes because they have a structure to them. Like I really went hard with the Merry War mm-hmm. and I very clearly saw that they that there were at least four fun and games in there. I bet you the Magic Potion, let, let's go through another Magic Potion film in just a second, but I bet you the Magic Potion keeps having those fish out of water. Okay, um, with the Magic Potion, Dealer's Choice. Have you seen Mannequin? A million years ago. Uh, I've seen uh, Penelope more recently. Yeah, okay. So Mannequin, if you know, is where um, Kim Cattrall is a mannequin. <laughs> it turns into <laughs> a mannequin. 
but I think, and I'm, and I'm, I'm well, she's a mannequin it. that turns into a person, right? She was, she was a person. Oh. She was um, forced into an arranged marriage in order to escape it. She prayed to the gods and the gods basically, I don't know what she was doing. Like the, the, the opening credits like shows what she was doing up until Jonathan made her into the mannequin. I can't remember. What they were. So she was like from like ancient times, mm-hmm. right? Okay. She was supposed to be ancient Egyptian. I, of course, the blonde haired, blue eyed Egyptian. That. All of them. As a kid, I thought she, this was happening in Greece. <laughs> yeah. I was so confused when I reread this. And I was like, wait a minute, what? Like your memories of things like <laughs> adapt <laughs> with you? Yeah. No, she's not Egyptian. Anyway. But Penelope, if you have seen the wonderful film Penelope, oh, my daughter, it was one of my daughter's favorite movies when Christina she was. Christina Ricci younger. and James McAvoy. Oh. It's delightful. It's so I should good. That again. Yes. I like to have my name in them. And that's- <laughs> <laughs> so not only is this about magic potions, this is a modern fairy tale. And magic potion doesn't always mean that they're like, you know, that they're like drinking a potion. It's just me saying like in the word magic potion. But Penelope um, is kind of a subverted fairy tale mm. um, where it's almost like the frog prince kind of mm. where she's frog. <laughs> yeah. And she's waiting for a kiss from her prince to turn her back into um, a normal girl. But how is, how is that magic potion in the, I mean, splash mannequin? Yes. Mm-hmm. But like Penelope is unique because she, spoiler, she has to save herself the love that she needs to, to transform her. She's born with this pig nose and everyone's horrified. And she thinks that she needs her true love to save her. So James McAvoy is this um, hustler. He's a gambler. He's down mm-hmm. in the book. He's like, oh, there's a big prize if they're the true love. It has to be a person of royal blood or not something like that. But at the end, she discovers that it's she has to love herself mm-hmm. in order to transform herself from having a pig nose to having a human nose and being accepted. And she finds acceptance and love for herself. And that's that's the magic potion? I think that this is where we, the conversation that we had earlier, where we were talking about formulas, formulaic and patterns, and then artistry. Mm-hmm. This is artistry. The mm-hmm. same way that Frozen was artistry, right? Because those girls saved themselves. In a sense, Pretty Woman was a bit of artistry too, because she kind of, she saved herself. Yeah. She saves him right back. Yes. Yeah, they save each other, which is always nice too. So there's still... This, it's layered. Penelope is layered to answer your question. She, it's magic potion because a, she's had a curse put on her to look the way that she does. And everyone assumes that the cure for this cu- cu- curse will be external. So everyone is making her go through the steps of curing this. Basically, go in, they're making her go through the rom-com steps when this is really a coming of age. Mm. So they're forcing her into the wrong movie and we're delighted because we all are expecting this to, we're expecting him to save her. Yeah. But that's not, the, that's not this kind of movie. Right. And so, yeah, in the middle of the movie, the rom-com beats, they're, they're done. They go away. And it becomes a transformation arc. And he has an arc too. Definitely. They both have really nice arcs mm-hmm. in this movie. But yeah, hers is coming of age. And I guess his is sort of too. He's got a, is this a redemption maybe? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. But is it a rom-com? I think that it is a rom-com that gets overtaken. I think it is a rom-com that's running parallel because I think that they start to weave it. Mm-hmm. It, it goes like one layer and then the, the, another layer comes in later. And then I think that they come back together because as she... Is uh, as he is going on his transformation to become a better person, and she is on the transformation to finally get out there and experience life and and let people see her for who she truly is. They don't come back together until they're both at their true essence. Yeah, because they can't love each other mm-hmm. in their identities. Right. So once they've healed separately, the rom com stops for a minute. Because it's like you get to the revelation and these people are not at their, at their, their essences. Mm -hmm. They're still, they're both still at their identities. Yeah. And so we need more story for them to come into their essence and then be able to love each other for who they truly are. And I think that is a good point because, you know, as we record this, our episode with Becca Mizor has just come out and talking about writing to market. And I think that's where, 
I remember I was saying something about like things that are new and fresh, you have to do something different. Like nobody knew that they wanted that until you mm-hmm. got Penelope. If you were kind of just doing the same thing in the mm-hmm. same vein, it wouldn't have happened. So you have to break out and be like, what can I do that is unique and different, incorporates the artistry that still has the things that people love because we all felt so amazing. It get, that movie just gives you a good feeling, mm-hmm. but it wouldn't have happened if you were too strict to any of these quote unquote rules. But I think that the, I, I personally think that magic is found in rules. I like to bump up against the rules, but I only know that I'm bumping up against something because I know that those guardrails are there. And then sometimes it just, you're, you're going along and we've all, we've all experienced this as writers. We're going along. We know what the next step, what the next logical thing in that story is, but it doesn't feel right. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's when that magic happens that says you need to do something different. But then when I need to do something different, I need a new set of rules. So I will, which is why I'm looking at Penelope and then I'm seeing that's a rom-com until about this moment. And then it becomes this transformation story, which mm-hmm. still has its own rules. So if I had if I had had the insight to see that this is um the rom-com stopped, I might have I might have just tried to force the rom-com in there and it was and you did what you were supposed to do. Right. He kisses her or maybe he kisses her and and he because he lied, now he has to accept her for who she is. But she hasn't accepted herself yet. So it's not going to work. Right. There's more work. So now I need this other new set of rules to follow. I don't disagree. No, I think I think that knowing the structure, you have to, or I, I believe you should know the structure so that you can know when to break it. Like that's just the basics. Mm-hmm. If you have to break it, you break it in a way that is not jarring for the audience. You break it in a way that still makes the audience feel good. Because mm-hmm. yeah, like you said, you switch to a new paradigm, to a new set of rules, mm-hmm. and then maybe come back. Mm-hmm. So you're drawing in other things that create the difference and the freshness and the uniqueness that people, I think, are craving a lot of times. Yeah. Yeah. But you only know to do that with with that time period that you're in. Like, if you if you made Penelope now, people would be... Would... <laughs> Here, Leslie and I might disagree again. Like, I feel like Barbie was a Penelope. Mm. And if, and <laughs> so like the Barbie movie that I think we were all expecting would have been a Barbie movie from like 20 years ago where um, she would have gotten together with Ken. Whereas I feel like a, a lot of women nowadays are like, I'm tired. And I, if, if, if this relationship isn't going to serve me, I'm, I'm out. P- like people wouldn't have heard that. Or different audiences would have heard that. I think that people were ready for Penelope saving herself first and then having love. And that now, today, people are ready for Barbie to save herself and then not have a relationship. And they were fine with that. I will agree with you on that. My opinions on Barbie, we don't have to go into on this show. <laughs> but- she loved it. Oh, please don't lie to the people. <laughs> But I will say that there is a kind of a resurgence of rom-coms as well. Mm -hmm. So there are people, I know there were some studies that said like Gen Z or Gen Alpha, whatever's after Gen Z. God, Alpha. Yeah, the younger ones don't want a lot of romance. And it just hurts my romance-loving heart to hear that. But at the same time, we're kind of in a resurgence of rom-coms as well. We're getting Mm -hmm. more of them back. Mm -hmm. So maybe they're for our generation. Maybe they're for older people. I don't know who it's for. I think there's room for everything. Maybe it's just a more expansive time where you can either get the guy at the end or you can not get the guy at the end and be very happy either way. And expansive is better. I don't want to replace anything, but like adding more is serving people. And if if you liked Barbie, like many people, then I'm glad for you. (laughs) You know what you just made me realize, Leslie? A lot of these movies are not that I chose to study are not super recent. No. They're not. So they're I'm not. sure that there's even more changes that have happened because I am old and, and crotchety and stuck in my ways and I want it. I want what I want. I mean, even think of the, the movie I talked about, No Hard Feelings, is a rom-com that doesn't end with the girl getting any that guy. That would make me upset. But it didn't make me upset as much as I love romance because 
she had a journey. They both have arcs. They both have mm-hmm. good arcs. They come out at the end better people because they knew each other. So it's like the rom-com, but platonic. And mm. it still managed to work. It was unique. I also was thinking about what is Crazy Rich Asians? Like, which of the deceptions is that? And that wasn't my favorite movie. Like, I, I thought it was fine. It was cool. But like, yeah, that's another kind of modern one that was extremely successful. And it felt like it was off the beaten path a little bit. Maybe it's identity. It's definitely not that. It's definitely not magic potion. Maybe it's identity because she wants these, the heroine wants the people. And it's her story. Mm-hmm. I don't think he had, I think he had a flat arc. Yeah. I don't think he did any much changing. So she wants these people to accept her for who she is. Their relationship, well, the relationship kind of is on the table a little bit. It's like, if she's not accepted, will they continue to be in this relationship? If she fails these tests by this, his, you know, hard ass mother and all the craziness that's happening. So I was, at first I was like, is their relationship in jeopardy at any point? But, and I, you know, it's been a couple of years since I've seen it. So I don't remember all the details, but yeah, maybe you're right. But I don't know. It's, they know who she is. She knows who she is. It's almost a pretty woman-esque in that she's in the wrong class. Yeah. Yeah. And that's never in doubt. She's not trying to pretend like she's in a different class. She's just trying to keep up with the Joneses, mm-hmm. as it were. Mm-hmm. And it it does become about acceptance. They have to accept her. Yeah. And she does have to bend a little and they have to bend a little. So was the deception that she didn't know how rich she was? Maybe that's what it is. It's, it's a fish out of water where she's not expecting everything that she gets herself into. Is that what it was? There is a part of herself that she does hide, though. Mm. She doesn't give them everything. Yeah. She is trying to be a part of this family while not giving over everything. And he initially does not tell her anything. Yeah. So that, that fits with that identity. Mm-hmm. It's just another very malleable way to look it's at it. It's like flipped. Yeah. Because he didn't tell her. And now she has to fit herself into this world. Oh, yeah. Like he was pretending to be a, norm- a normie. So the prince pretended to be normal and now you're in his world. How are you going to handle it? Okay. So it's the prince in me. It is the prince in me flipped or the prince in me part two, which I didn't see. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I did see that, but I, I have no recollection. Yeah. We're hard when it comes to sequels. But yeah, the, the, the question of looking at these again through a modern lens and thinking how has time and societal changes and cultural changes affected these rules. And I think it just makes them expand. It pushes them further. It layers them more on top of each other, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. And it gives you different outcomes than you could have gotten in the eighties and nineties. Yeah, I agree. But I love eighties and nineties storytelling. So if y'all gonna roll with me. <laughs> dust off your DVDs. <laughs> I still have a VHS player. Oh you. my gosh. I still have VHS tapes and Betamax tapes, but I don't Ooh. have a player. <laughs> we old, y'all. We old. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Leslie, speaking of old, did you have any everyday magic that has happened in your life since last we spoke to our dear listeners? Yes, I did have everyday magic. So I started doing these Facebook lives actually last year uh, for Preptober, which is October, where you, the month where you prepare for NaNoWriMo, National Novel Writing Month, and I've been wanting to get back to them. And so as we record this, I had started them again, building a romanticy world, which is the umbrella that they're under. Because I've got this world that I've been playing around with in short stories for years that I've never really fleshed out. So it's really fun to do Facebook Lives, even though I am a violent introvert. And so (laughs) you would think that that wouldn't be a thing I'd like to do. And it does drain my energy, but it also is so much fun to have people show up and, you know, you kind of create a little bit of a community and the same people show up and you get to know them kind of through the comments. Mm -hmm. And so I'm talking about kind of doing some workshop teaching as well as trying to get some work done. And I'm also doing some some live write-ins. Uh, and like writing sprints. But yeah, it's fun. It's fun to get a chance to kind of extrovert a little bit, talk about something I love, which is world building, build a world that I really want to build. This is like a side project for me, which is why I'm doing the lives, part accountability and part teaching other people 
I'm trying to help other people. So it was a lot of fun. It was really successful and we're going to do some more of them. And so whenever you are listening to this in the future, if you are interested, um, you can check out my website, myimaginaryfriends.net, because there's usually information about whatever I'm doing at the, at the given moment on that. Site. And they can also watch the replays if they're watching in the future. Yes. The replays are available on, on YouTube. Um, so yeah. Inez, do you have any everyday magic to share? I think that I do. Um, it's it's primary day when we're recording this, and me and my daughter, when when my kids were young, um, I would take them with me to vote, and then you know they have those future voter stickers. Oh yeah, yeah, and um, and they they thought we they thought we had a family vote. That's how they thought voting worked. Like, <laughs> we talked about it, and we we all went and we cast our vote. <laughs> yeah. Um, but my daughter's been um, overseas at school for the last um, election and she's about to go overseas again. <laughs> so she wanted to get at least one vote in, in person, because it's, it's a lot of hoops to jump through when she's trying to vote from overseas. And so we walked down to her old middle school um, and we cast her vote. And then we get, we finished and we get to the table and they have on the table, I voted. Cause you know, I was, I always joke like, that's the reason I'm here. I want the sticker. <laughs> and they had the, I voted. And then they had the future voter as well. And she hesitated for it. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you just voted. Right? You are no <laughs> longer a future. The actual sticker. Cause I don't think she's ever gotten this. Well, no, in, in other like early, like municipal and regional mm -hmm. and county votes she's gotten the sticker but this was like the first primary that she's voted in and she's like oh yeah you're right i i voted and she's she's um working a part-time job right now while she's saving up for grad school and so she's she now she's it's like mother daughter now she's like yeah i'm gonna go and wear my sticker so <laughs> that everybody can be like oh right i didn't vote yet because that's the mind. only reason to get to go vote is to get your sticker. You are the sticker queen. Any kind of sticker. Any kind of sticker. <laughs> so that was my bit of every everyday magic. And guys, we hope that you are having some magic in your life. Thank you so much for joining us today. Let us know what you think. You can leave a comment on YouTube with your thoughts on the episode. You can share it with a friend who loves romance. And please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And please also check out our book schedule on our website, inkandmagic.net, so that you can read along with us as we are barreling through the Side Changeling series by Nellie Singh. We've got some great book episodes coming and that we've already recorded. I'm so excited about the book we're reading right now, which you will hear about soon. And we will see you next time. Bye. Bye.